Welcome to our third and hopefully final uh, video of our summer assignment of chapter one. And in this one, we're going to be talking a lot about vectors. Okay, for some of you that are going to go, ooh, this isn't good. We're going to get better at it. We're going to get practice them. But as you're going to find out with AP, we're going to take what we've learned in regions and we're going to amp it up a little bit. And so there's going to be some things that are going to be brand new in this lesson. So I encourage you, take notes and notice the differences. And when you have to come back, and and see what's right rewind the video to hear what I say again okay and or come ask me questions now if I come back up to here sorry in many parts of physics we deal with locations in space and as such we need a mathematical way to describe these locations and what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a coordinate system so most of us are very familiar with the Cartesian coordinate plane with our X and our Y. And so as such, you can say, oh, well, there's an object right here at this spot, okay? And it's called a rectangular coordinate system. And so if you kind of break this up and you're like, oh, I've got one, two, three, and then one, two, three, four, five, whatever, you get the idea. So when I do this, I can say that it's a fixed distance away from this origin. And as long as I know what the origin is, I can know that object, that dot's location in space. Now, if I use a Cartesian coordinate system piece thing, uh, uh, labeling system, I can say, well, this is three units in the x direction. And in my case, I've got five units in the y. And so when we did this math, we labeled it as three comma five. And that gave its location relative to the origin. Now, another way that we have done this before it's given a new name, but you've seen it before, is what's called the polar coordinate system. And I'll highlight this. And basically now, instead of them giving it kind of like, oh, we're gonna go so long, far along the X, and then so far along the Y, what you'll get instead is you'll get a line. And this thing right here, this length of the line, tells you the distance away from the origin. distance from origin and then we also will have an angle which I will put in kind of a orange pencil right here and it'll give us our angle and that angle will be measured from our reference line and normally that reference line is going to be this horizontal positive x-axis reference line and so you might say oh well this is and I, I didn't actually figure it out hang on yeah, let me pause this I'll be right back so after the pause of me doing some math they tell me uh, I figured out that this length when I calculate is going to be 5.83 units long and the angle is going to be 59 degrees and again not really drawn to scale but we've dealt with this before, and you're going to see that as we go through. But just know that that's what's called a polar coordinate. So it's just another way of locating where a position is in space relative to the origin. But regardless of our coordinate system, whether we use a polar system, our Cartesian coordinate system, some other coordinate system, they all have to have, whatever we use, have to have three traits. They have to have a fixed reference point, a.k.a. the origin. That's number one, because that way we need to know, how, that allows us to see where we're we measuring from. Okay, if I just tell you to measure your distance, how far you went, you know, everybody's going to get different answers if we're measuring from different spots. They have to have a set of specific axes that are labeled. Okay, so you need to know, oh, if I'm going along the x-axis, uh, every tick mark is one centimeter or a meter or a kilometer or whatever. Okay, and then they have to have instructions on how to label a point in space relative to the origin. So the Cartesian coordinate plane, you would measure how far over in the x, how far how far up in the Y or down the Y, okay? And that's how you would label it. The polar coordinate, you measure the length, the distance away from the origin, and then what angle it is. Now this leads us to scalars and vectors. Now all physical quantities that we're going to talk about this year is going to fall into either scalar or vector. Now scalar quantity, those are really easy. They tell us only generally the size of the quantity. How big is it? 
whereas vectors give us more information. They give us both size and direction. I mean, we had many discussions about why vectors were so needed, the fact that why we have to have that direction in there as well. But going back, since vectors tell us both size and direction of the quantity, it's often convenient to represent them as an arrow. Where the length of the body, the line part represents the size of the vector, and the head represents the direction. And so if I have this, this is my vector A. And that arrow represents that I went a certain distance, whatever the length is. That'll be my size. And I took that in, and if I go by Cartesian coordinate points, I'm headed off to the east. And so that vector represents that I went a certain distance, or representing something, but that direction is always going to be east. Now, we always have to have, remember, we always have to have a scale to represent and say, oh, okay, well, this distance right here, okay, this represents five meters, or it may represent five newtons, or it might represent five meters per second squared, or five newton seconds, but some vector quantity, but it's going to represent some amount. And so I would know that anything that was this length would represent five. If it was twice as long, they would represent, you know, 10. Now, remember the key thing for adding vectors is they always have to add, add a special way, which is the head to tail method. Now, I'm going to show you this really quick. Get rid of that. Head to tail method. Okay. But this is on your notes. If you click on this, this vector addition, it will take you to a FET simulation and allow you to play around with this. And so you can go with 1D or 2D or do the lab, but I'm going to just show you really quickly to the 2D one. Okay, it allows you to bring in a vector. Bring it here, and I can put that anywhere I want, and what it allows me to do is it allows me to change it. And so oh, I'm going to do over this way. And then I can bring in another vector. Okay, and so I've got this vector here, yay. And now what it allows me to do is it allows me to find out the sum. And so that's the sum. Like, wow, okay, that's kind of weird. But if we add them head to tail, so I bring this down here and I attach that tail of C to the head of A, and then I can actually take this one and move this one around, I can show that my resultant goes from the tail of the first right here to the head of the last right here. And so I could actually figure out too, I can put in the values. So A is 25.3, C is 10. So my resultant is 24.1, and it'll also give me the angle. Oops, I jumped around. Sorry, my fault. Uh, I did not want to do that. Let me go to this. There we go. Let me, it'll also give me the angle if I don't click on the big thing. There we go. Boom. So my A is at 18.4 degrees, C is at 90 degrees, and from that I can find S. Now, the other nice thing about this, it allows me to also move it and change it as such. So I can bring this all the way up here, and then put this one here, like that. And so... I can see the angles and stuff like that, boom. So I can see, hey, my angle of A is 51.3, 25.6, C is now a negative 23.2, okay? And so at the end of the day, I can add them all together. If I wanted to add in a third, I could do that, change that around. At the end of the day, I can figure out, there we go, just like that, it's 180 degrees. But at the end of the day, I can see, I've used the end of the day way too many times. I can see that if I add them all head to tail, that gives me a result. So this gives you a chance to play around with it, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to jump back into our notes now. But if you get an opportunity, go back in and play with it. Okay, and again, this is, I wrote it on it again. Most important thing to know, always remember them to do head to tail. Okay, or the parallelogram rule of addition. And really, really, I didn't teach this last year, but I thought it might be worth it. Where if you have, okay, here's vector A right here. And here's, let's say, vector B, and I'll put B in orange, like that. Now, they're attached head to tail. My resultant is going to go up like this. So that's A plus B. The other way that I could do this is I could do the parallelogram method, which is that I could now put B and attach B over, you know, I could move A, sorry, hang on, put B here, it's wrong color, let me undo that. And then put A here. So here's A, here's B. And what I've done is I've made a parallelogram. So I've added now my tails. 
Okay, and I had them head to tail, and now I hold my head, so all my tails together, all my heads are together, and that shows me a result as well. So that's the parallelogram method. If you want further instructions on that or I talk about it, come see me. Okay, now note, vector addition follows the commutative law of addition. Okay, now we've talked about these before. These are easy. If two vectors are parallel, so here's my vector A, and here's my vector B, and they are parallel, my resultant is just the sum, is A plus B. If they are opi-parallel, remember that word that doesn't exist or never existed until I came up with it. Here's my vector A, here's my vector B, my resultant is going to be A plus B is actually going to be the difference. Difference and sum. Okay. So it's going to be in the direction of the bigger vector. There as well. Okay. Now, we want to subtract vectors. This is something we talked about last year, where that's nice and easy. Where uh, remember, if you have a minus b, that's the same thing as doing a plus a negative b. And remember, it is a property of all vectors that if the negative of the vector will point in the opposite direction. So if I want to do a and I've got b, oops, I'm switching colors, my fault. Here's my A, and here's my B. So if I want to subtract those, my negative B, which I'll put in blue, would look like that. Exact same length, just in the opposite direction. So now, negative B goes up here. And so my resultant, I'll put it down below, is a minus b. Remember, this is where things get weird. You can subtract things and still get a bigger number. Okay, you can add things and get a smaller number. So vectors are weird like that. Direction matters. Okay, and this is why. Okay, now if we're multiplying a vector by a scalar, just remember it just makes it bigger. So if this is vector a, this would be vector 2.5a. Looks like roughly like two and a half. So all I did was take vector A, multiply by two and a half, it changes the size of it, so the length of the arrow, but the direction itself does not change. Now the last two things, kind of, we're going to talk about as far as multiplication. Vectors can be multiplied, but they're special cases. There are actually two different multiplication ways, okay? And both of these are mathematical tricks, and we'll talk about them when they appear in physics, okay? The scalar quantity, if you multiply two vectors, will come back with a number. That number is just that. There's no direction on it, and that's called the scalar quantity or the dot product. And it's equal to the, side, the multiplying of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. The vector quantity will return a, sorry, another vector, and it's called the cross product. And these we will talk in greater detail later on. Okay. Uh, vector components, remember, this is how we go from polar what we did, what we thought was before, we said, hey, you traveled at five meters at an angle of 30 degrees. Remember, we always said, hey, we have to break that up into pieces. In reality, this is polar. And when we break those up into pieces, here's my a to the x and my a to the y. Basically, all we're doing is when we break that up, we're getting into the Cartesian coordinate planes. And so we've done this over, they're called projections or whatever, but it's just breaking them up into the Cartesian coordinate plane. And so we're going to work on breaking those up and adding them that way. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is something called a unit vector. A unit vector is just a labeling tool. Okay. So if instead if I had a vector that was three meters along the x direction okay and that was my vector we are using a mathematical notation called unit vectors call which will allow us to tell what direction it's going without actually having to write down east or whatever like that if i were to write this out this would be three meters in the three i hat meters and what that tells me is it's going to be a length of size of three and it's going to be going in the i hat direction now, if we go to their Cartesian coordinate plane, slide that over just a little more. This is our i hat. i hat is 
horizontal. J is our vertical. And then K, and I'm going to try and draw this, but it's going to get ugly, goes three-dimensional. So that would be coming out of or going into the page. Okay, And so we'll work on these as well. This was just meant to be an introduction. Okay, And what I'm going to have you work on is, if you look, and I'll jump back into Amos, there is a spot called Vector Review. Okay, okay. What are vectors? And the last thing I'd like you to do, this is our last assignment. Okay. I'd like you to just go look this over. It will tell you different things about vectors. Go back through the same explanation I did, but also talk about different ways of labeling them and how we break those apart. And then you will find that there are examples and actual practices, exercises in there. Sorry, I'm all already set off. Okay. There are exercises in there that you're going to do as you go through this. Okay. Now, all of these answers can be found out at the very, very bottom of this. But I'd like you to go through this. This is your last assignment for the summer. Go through this, check those things over, and when we come back together, we'll go over all of this together. So if you have any questions at all, please, please feel free to email me, okay, and I'll try and walk you through this. Um, we're not going to be doing the screen recordings the entire year, okay, but I thought it would be a good way to try and get Chapter 1 out of the way. We will be looking at taking a quiz on all of this during that first week of school. So hope you have a great rest of the summer. And I'll see you soon.